it's an, a very seductive decision to focus on building infra, like a, a new L2, than to actually focus on product market fit for actual users. Then the devs, you can't really blame them because if VCs are willing to fund them, they can have a guaranteed salary and funding, and I'm just going to spend the, new, the next few years building that. And maybe when Vitalik writes another blog post and we grow, and maybe that's when we think about the next milestone. Whereas on Solana, you don't have the excuse. It just works. You don't have an excuse. You, you can scale, just build stuff. Let's just see what people want and let's grow from here. And that's why I think the next breakout apps definitely are going to be out of Solana. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Marius and Mark, who are two DeFi builders in the Solana ecosystem, working on the Hubble and Camino protocol. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks very much. Pumped to have you guys on. Last time we saw each other was at Breakpoint, and it's been a couple of fun months since then. For this conversation, we want to talk about Camino and also Hubble, and a good part to start would just be the origin. So maybe, Marius, would you start for us? Yeah, basically... It, it, in 2021, um, I was working at a TradFi job, writing C++, um, and I was I really enjoyed my my the domain of my work, but I didn't really think there would be a lot of growth. And I saw that you know crypto was basically at the end, in the bull market at that time, so everyone was talking about it. And I was looking for jobs or things to do in in crypto, and I found out about Solana. This was this new chain uh, that was written in Rust. And basically Rust was this, this thing that I, I was, I was writing on the side. I was really passionate about it. And, um, I saw there was a hackathon and some guy on Twitter said that, uh, check out this hackathon. Uh, it might change your life. So I checked out the hackathon. I, I joined the team and I started writing some code and I just loved it. And basically I didn't have any like opinions about crypto before about what chain is best. You know, there was. I didn't know anything about EVM or I didn't know much about these things. So I just took everything from, uh, from zero and, uh, I just really liked it. And I, when I compared e EVM and Solana from talking to some people, I had like a, an open mind. I didn't have any bias or back bias. So I was just, it was obvious to me as an engineer that was working on, you know, like distributed systems that this is just a, a much better design. So then I thought, um, what's going to be Solana, what's the thesis of Solana going forward if we look at the current state of the DeFi market in EVM, because that was the only really, and, be, uh, and Binance Smart Chain. And it just made sense that a lot of stuff will happen and it will be a growth market. And uh, I want to be a part of that. And I was thinking, what would be, what would, would you need for any ecosystem to grow? And for it to grow, you, you, to, be, to begin with, you need the primitives. And uh, you need a DEX, you need a lending market, and you also need a, a stable coin. And there wasn't that much, that many stable coins at the time in Solana. So basically, that's why um, I said I'm going to start a new project and make a stable coin out of it. And uh, that was basically the beginning. Uh, talked to quite a few people who some of them were um, interested in funding me. Uh, started Hubble, and basically, we just built from there. Um, there was a lot of, you know, grinding and product market fit iteration to get to realize what is really the point of a decentralized stable coin and how should it be designed, etc. But that's kind of the origin, origin story. Two questions. One, if you're coming from the Ethereum land, is it fair to compare it in some ways to what Maker, how Maker works, MakerDAO? And then also, when you started Hubble, what was the status of USDC and centralized stable coins on Solana? Was that a big market yet? Um, yeah, it's fair to compare it to Maker at the, at the moment. Um, it started as a fork of Liquidity, um, which was which didn't didn't have a few features. Uh, we then pivoted away from Liquidity into Maker, and probably we're going to pivot again. Uh, so that's kind of the similarity between them. Uh, in terms of what was the um, um, uh, the adoption of stable coins in Solana at the time, USDC was the king. Um, basically the fact that now I realize, you know, when, when I was at the first breakpoint that Tolly was talking about how they managed to get native USDC on chain. And I didn't really know why, why it was such a big deal. And I do understand it now, uh, USDC was the biggest one, but Solana was relatively small chain. Uh, like the total TVL at that time was 300 million. So, and we had like Sabre and Solent wasn't even live, you know, at that time. 
So it was a, just a very nascent ecosystem. So there was, you didn't know how things would go, you know, uh, what, what, you know, the growth of an ecosystem is going to be, you know, in some cases they're obvious what primitives will be, but in some cases it's very path dependent. So, uh, you, you don't know which way it would go. That makes sense. And Mark, you were there during this time. Is that right? Yes and no. So I, I was there, um, when Mario started building Hubble, actually, I was, I was a Solana fanboy and, um, for, I, I guess like if I chart a little bit like my journey through life, I've been this non-coding finance nerd. Uh, so always at the intersection of tech and finance. And I worked, um, well, I'm British, live in Switzerland, um, been working for, for Swiss banks and, and regulated finance. Uh, in, in different kind of roles, um, found crypto, um, just through, uh, originally like trial and error and being in, interested in tech and markets. And then after meandering my way through like, uh, ETH and, um, BNB and missing out on, uh, DeFi summer, I like got, got to, got to know Solana and, and fe fell in love. I just became really passionate as, as a user and, and, um, experimenting with DeFi and I independently came out to Breakpoint in 2021, um, just, just to kind of check it out and, uh, you know, thinking about potentially doing something in the future with, with Solana. Um, and that, you know, raging bull market that like cemented my interest in, in Solana and uh, around that time, Someone uh, like a, a mutual friend uh, introduced me to to Maris and Thomas, who who were about to launch Hubble and have been been building it. Um, and yeah, I kind of took the plunge to join the team, and uh, yeah, I haven't looked back since then. So I also feel yeah, I don't know. I mean, does twenty 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 one does that make you a Solana OG? I'm not sure, but like uh, that was uh, that was like my my entry to to solid you know, started buying the token, thought I was a genius, you know, when it, when it, uh, three X in a few weeks and, um, yeah, it's been, it's been the emotional ride since then. So that's good background on Hubble. Um, a lot of people watching this will be degenerates and they will be very interested in Camino specifically, um, to nobody's surprise. Um, I do want to talk about maybe a bit about the origin of Camino specifically. So Mario, you talked about needing primitives for the DeFi ecosystem, right? And so obviously stablecoin, but then borrow lend, um, obviously a big part of that as well. So can you just maybe walk us through the story of how Camino came to be? But also at the time, I think there was probably multiple borrow lend solutions. And so you must have thought that there was still something missing. So like, what was the thought process there? Um, it was literally product by product by product, um, one needing the next one, giving the idea for the next. So, um, USDH, um, could not have scaled without inter in integrations. If nobody accepts USDH anywhere, then there's no point to, for the coin It's just like some, some random minted coin. So the. A stable coin is literally its demand. If there's no demand, there's no stable coin. Uh, so we, we built Camino as a way to give utility to USDH. The first thing that Camino did was to create a, um, a stable pool on top of Orca that would optimize for trading fees to give yield to USDH liquidity providers. So that was the very first thing that we did for, for USDH. Uh, it definitely improved a lot before that, if you wanted to provide liquidity for USDH, let's say a 1 million pool of USDH USDC would service five times less swaps because a swap, uh, using an old style pool would take more fees for the, for the same TVL. It's just like worse, uh, worsely designed. Um, and then we thought once we did it for USDH, we did it for other stable coins that were in Sana at that time. So UXD. And there was USH, there were several others. Um, and then the product kept growing and then we, it turned into this like vault product where basically you just had this optimized liquidity for stable coins and also for liquid staking tokens, liquid stake sol. 
Uh, there's a really nice vault right now, which basically if you put Sol and Jitosol, it tracks the stake rate of Sol and it's optimized for, for fees. Um, and then the next thing we, we wanted to do was, okay, we have this capital efficiency and it earns yield, so let's just allow it to be leveraged up. So for you to leverage up these vaults, which were, which were tokenized, you had to build a lending market. And we didn't trust anyone else to build a lending market that would take these things as collateral, approach the approach it in a risk in, in a risk aware way. So we had to build it ourselves. So that's kind of the the, the journey of Camino Land. So you weren't um, satisfied with the the risk appetite of, of the ecosystem at that time. So I do want to talk about like the margin soul and uh, debate that we had two weeks ago. Um, and maybe a good way to segue into that would be to just approach or, or understand Camino and your specific approach to risk management, how you think about risk. Um, and then, so that's more general. And then specifically what you would have done differently um, or what you thought about the soul and margin kind of debate about pegging or using the, uh, the soul asset for the, the liquid staking token. So, so yeah, to take these sort of things, K tokens as collateral, it's not something that you do it lightly, right? It, it's, you, I can't really blame anyone for not doing it. It involves quite a few layers of risk because the K token itself is the result of a smart contract and that smart contract itself has risks. So you're just layering risk on top of risk and it makes sense for someone else, someone that doesn't want to take that uh, extra risk uh, on their borrow land market to, to not do it. Um, so I'm not blaming anyone for not doing it. So Lend actually tried to do and uh, allow some of our tokens there, but they put it in an isolated market, which basically had no capital efficiency or not much appeal. So it was like pretty much dead on arrival there. Um, so that's, that's kind of the reason. And when we decided we're going to build it ourselves, there was actually after there was this USDH incident on, on Solend where one of the oracles was uh, manipulated. It was a very, very like weak oracle and um, it just, it just caused quite a bit of stress on, in general, on, on risk management. And uh, we really thought we could do this better. Um, I myself spent about eight years in my previous job doing things related to risk. I was working on um, exotic derivatives pricing. I was doing all sorts of things with like um, highly complex um, exotic uh, derivatives in TradFi. Uh, so I knew all about these uh, risk management uh, models, the simulations that you have to do, the how you think about, uh, how banks think about it, how funds think about it. So it just seemed that the risk in DeFi was quite early stage, basically. Uh, and it just like, we just decided we can do this better. We have the experience and we also have the engineering capacity to, to build these primitives. Um, so I, I would also just say, you know, the, where we were a year ago, right, you know, we, we'd just gone through this insane year of black swans, uh, FTX had blown up, Alameda had blown up. Um, the Solana DeFi landscape was was kind of wrecked, liquidity leaving, Solen closed down, they were, they were closed for multiple months. And yet, at the same time, you know, as, as well as questioning our our sort of sanity, uh, we were also passionate and uh, passionate about taking Camino to the next level. So um, we we'd done something with these trading vaults. We knew we wanted to have uh, leverage strategies that needed this this credit market, and um, yeah, you know, we we had the the experience both from from kind of like tradfi experience. Um, across multiple areas, including quant finance, risk management, as well as the development. And um, yeah, it just really made sense to, to, to double down on, on like building out something even cooler for, for, um, uh, for Solana DeFi, assuming that, uh, that Solana DeFi was, was still a thing, because that was actually, you know, before we kind of dive into actually just what we did with Camino, there was a lot of soul searching on like, where are we as well? Like, are we in the right place? Is there going to be on-chain activity? Is Solana DeFi a thing? Like, are we, are we like throwing our 
money away by continuing to invest in, in, in Solana and, and like look, looking around at, at um, trying to find some like, you know, the, the gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Like, uh, which, which chain has users, has stability, has the, um, uh, you know, the speed and cost uh, trade-offs as, as well. And um, yeah, we, we always landed back with, with Solana. To build on. One interesting thing I would add to that, if you've listened to our Margin Phi Solon episode, is just talking about how they think about risk management in the sense that Solon's been in the ecosystem longer and they've gone through a lot of these ups and downs that you were talking about, Mark, and talking about these Oracle failures and also net- network failures. And because of that, it's almost like there's been some scar tissue built up and how they approach risk management. Ooh. And that's one reason why they chose the Oracle price to look at Sol and not... um the stake soul, for example, and then margin five is a bit newer. And at times it reminds me of like a 20 year old doing a startup and you have like all these ambitions and you don't have the scars that you built up from maybe some failures in the past. And in some ways you can actually have innovation through that because you're, you don't know, right? You're just, you're like pushing it to the limit. To add to what you said, I definitely agree with you. I think uh, you can't dismiss uh, what Solent has gone through. They have a lot of experience that it's 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 super valid uh you you just you really can't fake that like you know they said things like we've seen the oracle fail we've seen the uh the whatever the confidence check fail we've seen all of these things are things that you only see when they happen to you you can't conceptualize them it's it's really very, it's extremely hard to start uh you know um imagining fee, uh situations and preventing them you can do everything you can, but at the end of the day, the market will do things and you will not expect them. And what Solent did, what Solent went through is basically inviolable. And I think it would be very infantile to ignore all of that. So to basically, uh, we, we are, I, I'm on the same page with, uh, with Ruter. We have the same mechanism for pricing uh, uh, six all derivatives. I think that that's the right way to do it. Um, I think MSOL, like if, if you consider the trade-offs of like choosing one price or the, or, or the other, I do think that there's a lower chance of pool drainage of, of these staked sold derivatives than of price manipulation or Oracle failure. And actually last week we saw that there was an issue with BSOL, which is exactly what you would expect. There was some, probably some stuff with Jupiter where some prices were not being fed. Then those people that were not calculating the price correctly, they were feeding it into Pith, which was taking it into account, which was giving you wrong prices. It literally came to fruit within two weeks, within one week of your podcast. So we were pricing it using the stake rate. So we take the stake rate of Sol to, to, to Jito Sol or stake rate Sol to M Sol and multiply it by the price of Sol. And uh, we think that's the most resilient way to do it, take into account all, all of the, all the other trade-offs. So, um, yeah, and the MSO situation, I, I wrote a thread about it, but basically there's very thin liquidity. It's super easy to manipulate, uh, even if you don't want to manipulate it, but some, some whale testing liquidity is just going to nuke the price and there's nothing you can do about it. No matter no, how much, no matter how much you talk about that, that's the true price. At the end of the day, you have to manage risk and, uh, you know, debt backing that collateral and uh, you have to choose how to do it. And I think that's, uh, it's more likely to happen than uh, uh, the, the, the pool being hacked. Um, yeah. But there's always the objective and the subjective with, with risk management, right? There's, there's many knowns and, you know, we've got this risk dashboard and, and, and we try to do as much as possible to analyze and take like rational objective decisions, but ultimately, you know, it comes down to subjective decision making and even you know we saw that saw this on the discussions as well which you referred to with, with Edgar and Ruta right you know both you can listen to that and 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 see the validity in 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 each perspective and that's what makes this this stuff difficult um that trade-off's being played out in in multiple other other assets um even if we go back to the the days of uh, solid Bitcoin on uh, on Solana, right? You can you can say, okay, well, for for my protocol, I'm I'm going to use the the this kind of global Bitcoin oracle to price Bitcoin, and uh, and then we saw this situation where Bitcoin on Solana just became worthless, right? So using the real true on chain price of Bitcoin on Solana was eventually um, the 
the, the way to go for, for what played out in that specific situation, which is, of course, um, quite nuanced, different from, from, uh, from like MSOL, of course, because of the counterparty risk. But um, yeah, these are all these, these are all decisions that have to have to be made, right? You know, um, on chain liquidity can be on, on Solana can be manipulated more easily than the global price of, of Bitcoin, right? But then, um, but then, yeah, unknown situations or unforeseen situations can can definitely play out. Marish, what are some explicit? concrete things that you guys do differently than other protocols and managing risk? What are some things that you think the users listening to this should know about? The, the basics, of course, you have to do your smart contracts have to be absolutely, you know, immaculate. Um, if you have a bug somewhere, like we saw this morning with uh, Radiant, then you'll be manipulated and there's nothing you can do. Um, that's, part, that's part one. And we have basically hired um, one company that did an audit and then another company that basically did like bug bounty. So they get paid per bug. So they're basically incentivized to find bugs. And basically they, while we were developing, they've been, they've been very uh, helpful to us. And we have another bug bounty ongoing from, from the same guys, a new, a new researcher. So we're just constantly stressed about this. It's like table stakes, but not everyone does it uh, uh, maybe just as seriously. Um, and then the other part is basically, okay, let's say the, the protocol works as you, as you described. So as a, as a lending market, you have two jobs, right? You have borrowers and lenders, lenders give you some, some tokens and you give it to the borrowers and you make, you want to make sure that the lenders get their money back always. So when the borrower wants to borrow something, he has to put some collateral on the side. And if he doesn't come back or if the market threatens that his position is not worth as much. You want to liquidate it as soon as possible. So you basically have to manage the, the, the borrowers essentially, and you manage it by this thinking how much, uh, what, what risk are they allowed to take? And when do you stop? Uh, when do you allow them to, to borrow more so than in another pro 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 protocol, for example. And, um, there are basically two ways to look at that. One is daily caps and, uh, global caps how much soul should be uh, borrowable or de depositable in your protocol. And that amount basically has to be enough such that if you have to liquidate it tomorrow, based on a probability of a market crash tomorrow of 20% or 30%, you'll be able to sell all of that to get back the borrowed amounts to give it to the lenders. So that's kind of the only way you have to think about it. Is the collateral that is backing the debt, can it be liquidated? fast enough? Is there enough liquidity on the market to be liquidated fast enough such that you can repay the, the lenders? And uh, you basically have to look at the, um, uh, you have, we have like a, a dashboard that continuously monitors the liquidity on the market. How much, how much, you know, slippage do you get if you sell sol? What is the volume of sol, etc. for 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 10 million dollars. Uh, for that, we basically uh, use an API backed by Fibonacci, shout out to Shimon and Sam for, for, for providing that API. Um, we have a few models that basically calculate the, pro, the, the impact of price, price changes. So let's say if the price, so price of sold drops by 10% tomorrow, how much is liquidatable? If it drops by 20% tomorrow, how much of the market is liquidatable? And based on the amount of that is liquidatable, let's say $10 million, can I sell all of that on the market right now based on the current liquidity and how much slippage do I get? Uh, and if, is that slippage enough to cover the debt that has to be repaid? So that's how we look at it. We have a public dashboard risk.camino.finance and it literally tracks all of that. Um, that's basically the very short, long, long version of, of things. Um, I think one thing that people get wrong usually is that they think that they can monitor risk and they put caps and the job is done. But the problem is that the, the market, the market changes without you knowing. So liquidity changes. There's a drop of 20% in one day, liquidity vanishes. Um, and you have to be able to react to market changes. And if you have too much collateral in the system at one go, there is really not much that a lot of DeFi protocols can do. And the one thing that we did that we haven't seen in Solana is automatic deleverage. 
So we have a process where basically um, if we consider, if the risk council consider that there is way too much collateral in the system, we can trigger a process where basically a margin call period is given to some depositors or actually to the entire pool. And if they don't uh, unwind their positions, then they will slowly be unwound uh, in an auction system with the minimum liquid liquidation penalty. Uh, and then and then more and more until they all unwind. So you have to basically have a way to monitor risk. If it's too much, unwind it. If it's too little, allow it to grow back again. Just to, to add to that kind of comprehensive overview is, is just this sort of ethos of introducing this primitive, but also in this spirit, which we've tried to, to, to kind of live in Camino of transparency, which started out on the market making side. So investing heavily in uh, analytics so that uh, performance, which is often a black box in, in, in DeFi, right? Especially when APYs are thrown out all over the place, but that we could look at performance in multiple di dimensions. So like pro profitability, but then as we've built out Camino Lend, that also moves in into risk management and, and transparency around exactly what we're looking at and how we're thinking about risk, sharing our um, like risk engine, risk, risk dashboard uh, publicly day one, sharing the code uh, day one, of course, um, with it being open source. But like living out this, this like DeFi should really be not just about like the smart contract transparency, but just like the whole methodology and process transparency. Because, you know, as, uh, you know, I think we, our background is broadly as a team come from like the traditional finance world as, as, as well as some like tech industries. Um, so whether it's like developing in Bloomberg, which Marius was, or myself in like um, tech product management in, in, in trading and payment operation systems, uh, like everything's about a dashboard and about the models behind it, what's going on uh, always. And then, uh, same on the quant, the quant finance side from, from from our quant, but like living that really uh, in 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 what what Camino puts out there for users as well. Yeah, those are really great answers. Um, one more question on risk management, and then we'll get to the future of Camino and and what to get excited about. W one thing that like popped in my head as you're talking about all this is right now Camino doesn't have a token. One thing that often comes with tokens is governance. And with governance, you might have a slower reaction time to what's going on in the markets because you're really well known for your risk management engines, doing this analysis, both on-chain and off-chain. But what, how do you guys balance or think about these concepts of lending protocols like Camino once a token is introduced that might have something like governance mechanisms? And I also think of Gito because in Solana, you're seeing all these token launches and Gito is coming out with StakeNet, which is like this way to monitor statistics on-chain and have everything beyond chain through a smart contract, but that's very backward looking. And it feels like with you guys and Camino and just lending, you do want backward looking data, but also the markets move so fast. You can't only look at that. You have to look at like what's happening right now. So how do you guys think about that balance between having this like quick reaction time and also moving towards something like on chain governance? Well, I mean, ideally you don't want to go to do any governance, um, if you don't have to. So I'm constantly thinking about market triggers that could um, um, eliminate a governance decision. So for example, let's say I want to unwind a specific amount of collateral. Let's say there's way too much soil onto the market. How do I, um, gather that? What, how do I think about it myself and how can I automate my thinking uh, on smart contract level? So you can do quite a bit of things with that. You can build all sorts of art, uh, or oracles that allow you to do that. And, um, I think the point is that you don't want to be in the situation where you have to react fast. Um, I, I think that's very difficult. That's, that's a dangerous situation to be in. That's why you want to be proactive, um, kind of expect the worst already ahead of times. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's not an answer. The answer is that when you have to do it, um, what do you balance out more? Do you balance out the, do, do you care more about the, um, who do you value the most, the, the token holders or the, or the, um, or the lenders in the protocol? And I think the lenders are the most important people in the protocol. So you have to find a way to uh, keep them, them safe. I don't really have an answer to you. Um, 
I think governance is still something we're thinking about, but decentralized governance is something that is not extremely well proven. And I don't think it's very well proven in something that requires so much deep knowledge as risk management on some, you know, financial market. I think, I mean, you, you can't, I don't think you can approach this with like, with like a startup mindset or like, we're just going to reinvent risk management or we're going to reinvent decentralized governments or uh, these, these things have been going on for just tens or, I don't know, maybe hundreds of years, how you manage risk on a lending book risk or anything. This is just, this is not something new and the methods are known. And every time there's a market flash or there's like some crazy volatility event, a, a percentage of the existing market player, they get flushed. So that's just like, kind of like a law of the jungle. So, um, you have to approach all of that with all of this knowledge, with all of this, um, background and context before you start reinventing the wheel, in my opinion. Um, so when you take risk, you have to err on the, on the side of caution and be as, uh, uh, as safe as possible. Um, yeah, that's kind of my, my thinking about it. Hmm. I agree. I, I would add a couple of anecdotes there. You know, we've got this concept of the risk council, right? Which is, um, currently made up of, um, some of the Camino team, right? Conceptually, we'd love that to be a community, um, kind of body, right. And especially, you know, the token comes into it and, and, and it, and it all turns into like the decentralization, the, 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 the voting and so on. Like Marius highlighted some, some issues there. We've, we've definitely seen examples of like this lack of uh, agility of uh, decentralized governance. And then also a lot of, you know, a lot of what we're fending off on a daily basis is from, from the community. It's very hard to, to bootstrap that right, um, body of experience, right. You know, the, uh, the community and quite rightly, you know, a uh, very, very much like, you know, raise the caps and, and, uh, you know, give us, give us more leverage power and, and, and everything and quite, you know, you, you can understand the, the, these requests, right. So, um, we have to like balance all of the different, uh, stakeholders, uh, when it comes to, to, to governance and, um, yeah, it's, it's not something that, that, that is like super easy to, uh, to think of a dream scenario of it working uh, on day one. Um, I think we should talk a bit more about, first of all, two things. One is, there, so there's Camino 2.0, um, which you guys did uh, a big push on. So I want to make sure the users understand what's different about Camino 2.0, because um, I took a look and I like it a lot. And I know you guys have some ideas for it and to keep evolving it. So number one, yeah, I'd like to hear about that. And then number two is going to be the question of the day that everybody's going to listen for, which is what is up with the points, right? Can you tease the audience with any points <laughs> talk? Uh, I thought it was going to be when, to when token. That was, uh, <laughs> I thought that was going to be the question. <laughs> um, so coming on 2.0 is basically a, a, a set of protocols that work together to give you basically DeFi things to do. Um, Camino 1.0 was purely uh, vaults, very few limited vaults. Camino 2.0 is a set of a much larger set of vaults with m more interesting strategies for all kinds of uh, pools, um, combined with the lending market, which can work by can work with it by itself, with just to do borrow and lend, but also can work with the vaults to leverage up the vaults. Um, the point of Camino 2.0 is to be to kind of grow into a I don't like the term, but let's say into a super app. Um, and the thesis is that, um, there is going to be economic activity and there is economic activity on chain. Um, the, the most primitive version of that is the token and basically, basically people want to hold tokens, trade tokens, swap them long, short, do all sorts of things with tokens, launch them. And that's, that's kind of like, as soon as you trade them, it becomes an economy. As soon as you want to borrow something to leverage something more up, then it's just economic activity or financial activity. And uh, Camino basically wants to service that. Whatever the economic activity that will be on chain, Camino will be there to try to service and to help uh, that sort of activity. Um, we don't have a, an opinion on the type of tokens or a thesis on what tokens will be the ones that will be the best or if it's RWA or 
if it's shit coins or if it's like um, um, commodities or utility tokens or governance tokens, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Camino is basically going to be there to service uh, to service the on-chain activity, and that can be trading volume, that can be uh, leverage, can be long, short lending to other people, launching the tokens, whatever that would be. That's kind of the point of Camino. Um, even if Solana ends up being like the NFT chain or the social chain or whatever Solana ends up being, basically there will, uh, there will always be tokens and economic value on the chain. And when there is economic value, there's the need for custody, there's the need for borrowing, there's the need for for all sorts of things. And basically Camino um, should be there to service all of that. In terms, in more concrete terms, you know, right now we have a lending market, we have a Vols product, we're going to add a Meteora DLMM to the Vaults protocol as well, um, and more integrations between the Vaults and the lending market. And then we have a lot on our plate at the moment, but then we will see what, what next comes. We're, we're, we don't have, we, we, we have a lot of ideas, um, but, um, but we're managing quite a lot. So we want to make sure we do it, uh, we, do, we do everything well and it's stable, etc. Maybe Mark can answer the question about uh, the points. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event I promise you don't want to miss. It's BlockWorks' biggest and best institutional conference called DAS London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March. We're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers, and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions, and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real-world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing. And then we have things like Deepin happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now, and this institutional space is going to be coming on chain it's going to completely change the industry whether you are an institution or you're a retail user or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space this conference is for you you're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space the speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me but the best part is you actually get 10 percent off your ticket if you use lightspeed 10 when checking out i put a link in the show notes um i recommend buying this today because one you'll forget about it two these ticket prices go up every single month so anyways i hope to see you there now let's get back to the show what, one more thing before we get to the points that I'm curious mm. on. When you say super app, and I, and I know you mentioned this a little bit, what are you looking to build in-house versus what are protocols in Solana that you're integrating with? And, and what are you already integrating with today? Like you mentioned Orca earlier. I think Drift is there as well. Can you explain that a bit? Um, I want to answer this one um, because I have a very strong opinion here. If we're going to build a protocol, it's going to take you six months to a year to build it, if you want to do it right, because you'll have to think very hard about, we'll have to really understand it um, because there will be lines of code, which which if you change some, everything will change about it, unless you do something very simple, right? Um, so building a protocol and taking it to market can take you up to a year of quite a few engineers and designers and auditors. And it's extremely time consuming because you're not in like the web 2.0 world where basically you just ship something, it breaks co customer complaints and you just go and fix it. Uh, you're more in the sense in a, in a very adversarial environment where if someone discovers a vulnerability, he's already out out to the door in tornado cash by the time you realize it. So it's it, it's way way more difficult to to build something on chain. Um, so we will not build something that someone else has built it, and we trust the team. So we do just to take the simplest example, we do trust Orca. I think they built a really good primitive, the, the, the CLMM product, it's been extremely well battle tested. I don't see any reason why Camino would go and build a CLMM. Uh, we, we, we can compose with them. We trust them. They're safe. They're battle tested. It's, it's, it's great. Um, the more a protocol becomes battle tested, the more likely it is that we would, we would rather integrate it than, than, than write it ourselves. That's kind of how I think about it. Um, that's like the, 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 the baseline. It, it's extremely expensive to build something. And I might, I might as well just compose with someone else and find uh, some coordination with the other teams. Yeah, because I would, I would have to like, we're, we're giving a complementary uh, sort of a value add, right? Like, that was the initial thesis of, of Camino. It was take this great primitive, which is concentrated liquidity for, for token trading, but give something on top. So give these composable vaults, uh, auto management, professional market making strategies, 
And yeah, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We didn't have to like build our own CLMM. Um, we, we work with Radium and Orca, who are, who are great to, to kind of collaborate with and, and, and to build on. And then we've got like the Camino Touch on top. Camino Lend, we did need to own the primitive, right? Because that's the, uh, you know, just to go over, you know, what we talk, talked about already, the money market. And then the third pillar is, let's say, we've got the borrow lend primitive. We've got the uh, market making primitive, like serving uh, all of these tokens moving around. And then the third pillar is this automation layer. So tying it all together into this super app, because then we've got products which um, are you utilizing each and both of those primitives, right? So taking the concentrated liquidity positions and leveraging them up on, on the money market. Um, and yeah, and having, having this kind of um, great UX thesis analytics and yeah, the, the whole like super app style. Let's go into points next, Mark. I think one thing I'd like to add, though, and it shows the power of Solana is not only this composition or composability you're talking about now, but even just like the Jupiter plugin, I think you guys have, right? Like if you come to Camino with Soul, I think you can quickly swap in and out automatically with one click to deposit to a vault, which is just a really cool situation you can do on Solana and nowhere else. But um, anyways, Mark, but yeah, let's let's talk about the points because that's what everyone wants to hear. Yeah, so we're about to uh, kick off a points program. And I think the concept there, right, was that we... We wanted, especially with launching a, a whole new uh, piece of Camino with Camino Lend, right? Is how do we how do we kind of incentivize users to do stuff on Camino Lend, which is not just useful for them, but also useful for us as a um, as a protocol. And points can be a great way of of achieving that right because we have this this kind of like gamification uh element but can also uh somewhat guide user behavior in in directions that is always useful for the for the user but is also productive to us as a as a protocol and um yeah in essence points is about to is about to to, to drop um Everyone who's been using Camino so so far uh, is uh, earning points, but what what isn't yet there is this UI explaining uh, what's going on, how to earn points, what earns more points, leaderboard, and so on and so on. And um, yeah, we've kind of been you know from day one we've said there's going to be a points program, it's coming, um, but it's it's soon, but that soon is you know. <laughs> Getting getting very close now, so it's a, it's about it's about to drop, and um, yeah, ultimately, I mean, there's there's going to be um, even though we've been talking about it, it's still not started. So there's going to be a bit of a an evolution of points, um, but yeah, in essence, it it's, it's going to allow users to to earn points by doing different different stuff on on Camino, especially in Camino Lend. Nice. Um, do you guys, Mars, do you have any other final things you want to get across about Camino and, and your philosophy on tokens and points before I completely shift the context? Uh, yeah, I think there's very few people that do points well, in my opinion, uh, in, in crypto. And um, we, we've been thinking about it uh, quite a lot. I think now that Juto has dropped, you know, uh, the, the expectations of, of users has completely changed. There's a lot more mercenary users out there. Um, we've seen that if you do only one round of points, then the users leave. So it's almost like you tell them, um, okay, game over. You can go to the next, play the next game, go farm points the other in the other place. Uh, th this is definitely something we don't want to do. Uh, there will be multiple rounds of, of points and airdrops. Uh, oh, I said airdrop. Yeah, and um, and yeah, basically, there it's it's not gonna be like a, a one-off thing, and um, for sure, it's a it's gonna be we've thinking about been thinking about it for for a while, so it, it, we're gonna give our our own twist to it, and it's not something we it's not like okay, let's just give points and that's it. Uh, we we want to do it uh, well. All right, that'd be nice. 
uh, excited for it. Okay, so I will shift context. Um, one thing that um, I think you do really well, and I would say you're probably one of my favorite accounts on Twitter to follow, is, is be, be vocal about your thoughts and what you think is right and what you think is wrong, which definitely needs to be done more on all uh, sides, especially smart DeFi people. Um, what, what inspired you to do that? Um, and, and, and what is your kind of philosophy on, on being an advocate, um, and, and, and speaking out about, you know, the, the standards and ethics of the space? Um, thank you for that, by the way, I, I think you, you're, you're, you, I, I follow your, I have your notifications. Um, Okay, so basically the idea is that we've been we've been building for a for a while, and we've been building extremely seriously. Like uh, in the bear market, we didn't chill. Like Mark here is, you know, he he knows we've been going very hard. Like you know, last year and this year, January, February, March, we just no matter the price, we just we were just building every day, and we were looking at the at the market a lot, like what's happening with that protocol? Why is that not working? Why is so there was such an excruciating experience that um, we basically had to unveil, you know, the, the truths, you know, in the sense, like understand how this market this really, really works. You know, you come to crypto with this like idea, I, I, like um, ideals, you know, someone sells you the, someone sells you a vision that this is about changing the world and, you put your own perspective on how you, you paint your own uh, vision, but then you come in, the reality is different, or maybe it's slightly different, you know? Uh, so if you don't want to go through the pain and if you, whenever your these like ideals get invalidated, it's painful and you have to accept them. And especially if you're building a protocol that on, on which is, on which uh, its survival depends, your understanding of the market depends on influences the survival of a protocol. You have to be very honest with yourself and really, really understand it and not put your own opinion on how it should be, but rather what it really is. Right. So I think we basically, we were talking daily for hours building, you know, for months in a row for, for like two years, you know, two years and a half. And we had to understand how basically things go and work in Solana. So I think we learned a few things, you know, we un unveiled a few things and it really pisses me off when people just say, say stupid shit that they haven't really thought about too hard or they just, think it's just like this uh, um, um, just because they're vocal or because they have many influencers they 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 can get away with it and uh, I think it's basically unfair to a lot of people who are doing like honest work etc so I want to basically add up bring up all of my knowledge and uh, experience and uh, you know understanding of things and speak out to whoever is listening uh, so that at least you know um, they know they're not alone, for example, that they, I think we think the same. I know there's a lot of people that think the same, but they don't say it. And, and, it, and it just has to be said. A lot of things have to be said so that, you know, it doesn't remain, you know, if there's anyone to listen, they, they will listen. So, for example, I disagree with a lot of things that are happening in crypto with like people coming, trying to reinvent the wheel or, you know, ignoring past lessons, ignoring all sorts of, you know, realities. And it's just like, uh, it's absurd, and if you want this space to be mature, you have to you have to bring quite a bit of you know maturity and experience in the space. That's kind of how I think about it, and I'm just gonna speak it to whoever listens. And uh, I know quite a few people that I respect. They listen to me, or like they 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 follow my uh, my Twitter, and uh, I want to share what I think with them. You know, that's like a few. I don't want to share it with the guy that shows that searches for the next meme coin. But for some people, I want to participate in the conversation so that the space evolves and the right thing is done. Or I, I, I want to contribute. That's kind of how I think about it. And uh, I think I have something to say. Uh, and I don't come out of like just um, purely like engagement farming. I, I actually think I don't do too much of that. You know, so someone has to speak out so that there's some balance, you know, the, uh, in the world, in the universe. I think Marius, you've started getting more more people blocking you now, right? Which is probably the sign <laughs> of, of like your 
confidence of, of speaking out growing. Well, yeah. So uh, I am curious um, on maybe some lessons you guys have learned since you've started your company um, and, and been through Alliance as well. Uh, if, if you have any like advice or lessons you've learned that you can impart for the aspiring startup founders or just current startup founders right now listening to this that that you'd like to share um yeah i think i think i don't know if anything but basically uh this was like you know like for especially for people who want to apply to alliance if they want to go who for whoever has no alliance is like a crypto accelerator uh, you apply and then you get like a two months or three months uh, program where you go through all sorts of uh, discussions and themes and you have speakers from, you know, even like Solana speakers or like Tolly even, or uh, people from every ecosystem come and they talk to you and they talk to you about legal and token launches and ecosystems. And and uh, then they talk about startups and growing a team and interviewing basically everything. And you also end up with a, with a, um, uh, a forum that's private and founders talk quite a lot there and they share opinions and it's like really quality. Um, the the one thing that I found the most useful is basically having a mentor. So we have Xiao, who is kind of our our mentor from, from Alliance. Uh, in the bear market, maybe sometimes we speak once, uh, once a week or the chat daily sometimes, you know, and um, you feel you felt like you're alone quite a lot and you don't know what to do like what's the next play and uh they are there to remind you of some fundamentals that you haven't seen because you haven't seen companies struggle and then make it you know so they will tell you stuff like you have to persist you have to understand the market you have to understand your users you have to build something that people like you have to follow feedback uh you you have to understand that crypto is cyclical so there are all of these things that you just have to hear them in the background as you're fighting with your daily, you know, fires, and uh, just having them as reassurances to know their like their fundamental truths that they apply, even though today is a bad day or it's a good day, you know, they're like guiding you and they're like kind of like your your sounding board. Uh, so I think the mentorship is huge, and especially it comes from someone that is experienced and it's not some. It's not, it's not just your team, you know, like your team is going to be biased. You can talk to your team and say, okay, we're going to do this now. And they're going to be like, amazing. Uh, you have to, when you talk to someone that is experienced, they, they will reason through it with you. They will challenge you. They will make you, they will say things that will be unpleasant to you. You know, like Shawa told us quite a few times, you're doing too many things. Just stop that, focus on that. Look at this market. This is ready to go. Uh, you know, this is not a good product. This is not a good idea. Don't do it. You know, uh, it's very useful to have someone that can tell you and, you know, they say it out of like experience and not just like, you know, they want to, to please you or they just read it in a startup book, you know? Um, so I think finding a mentor is huge and has to be a, a I think it has to be a, um, a founder friendly mentor, not like, okay, there are people who are good. DeFi OGs who've been through like multiple cycles and they understand the market, but they're not going to be a, a mentor to you that understands how product, how you, like the, the pains of a founder, for example, or the issues that you, you face when you, you know, you, you struggle. Um, so you, if you have both in, in, in one single company or entity or accelerator, like a DeFi OG and a startup founder OG, then that's a great combo and it's someone you want on your side. I'm a fanboy of, of Chow. He's awesome. We've had him on the show. Um, he, had a, he had a tweet the other day. He was actually responding to someone else that was saying how great crypto would be if there's no tribalism. And he responded with like, that's really a naive take and how important tribalism is to some extent in crypto and how consequential it is for a team to actually pick which chain they're going to build on. And Marius, you then responded to that in agreement. So I'm curious if you can talk about that further. Uh, yeah, basically, and basically this is the sort of thing that you get from talking to someone that is so experienced because maybe this is the realization that you, you, you come to after six months of grinding, let's say, you know, it just takes you a long time. You come with the wrong assumption. You think, okay, tribalism is bad. And it's just like, you make decisions or you're built on multiple chains or you do all sorts of things. And you end up, I wasted so many resources on this. And I re realized after six months or after a year and millions, millions of dollars spent that actually that was a really bad decision. And this is, this is a decision that you acquire over 
there's just no shortcut to acquiring this wisdom. And that's when someone that is experienced can save you months of pain just by uh, telling you these things and being able to articulate it in a way that you get it. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, that's how you, that's what you get in, in these experienced mentors. The, the, what I think about tribalism in crypto is that for, for a team, um, it's basically an existential risk if the chain or the infrastructure from which you build fails, because you spend just months and months building infrastructure and databases and indexers and lib libraries and domain knowledge. And sometimes you do it wrongly and then you realize I can do it better. And it just takes you months to iterate to understand how to build on top of the infrastructure, which is the chain, which is in our case, Solana. Um, if Solana fails, then you have to kind of wipe out so many months of just domain knowledge acquisition to go to a new chain. And that is extremely expensive because developer time is expensive uh, and your own emotional labor and energy is, is, is wearing out if, if you won't have to start again and you, you throw uh, into the bin all of, this, all of this experience. So you have to root for you know, the chain on which you build to make it um, because, uh, because you're so invested in it and it's just so expensive. So I, I, for example, I don't really believe in multi-chain uh, at least as a young team, as a small team, maybe if you're like massive, like Uniswap, where they have like hundreds of BD people, uh, then maybe that makes sense. But as a, as a young team, there's just no way you can, you can deeply understand the ecosystem and the people and the, the history of and the context and what people like in that chain, just by, you know, writing code for a different language, in a different language, you know. And Mark, I'm curious if you have thoughts on this as well. One thing I've been shilling on on Twitter and support of Solana is how the extension of the SVM is relatively bullish for all the teams and capital coming in the space. Because as like a VC investor, you see a project, it looks great. The things you want to know, like, is the timing right? Is the TAM, the total addressable market big enough? And when you just had the SVM on Solana, yeah, it has a large upside, but it could be limited in some sense. Whereas something like Eclipse is extending the SVM further. I'm curious... Do you see that as something that's very positive for Solana in the sense that if you're a developer in the space, it's like, I can launch on this chain. If I ever do want to go multi-chain, now there are SVMs in other places. And also, maybe there's a little less risk because you're not just dependent on one ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, th I think like SVMs are obviously um, much, much younger and there's no need right now to be like hunting for the next big SVM to, to deploy on like as a, as a team building on, on Solana. But that, I think that Tam, uh, the Tam story is, is very valid and over time it's going to play out some more, right? You know, we've seen, um, maker like Ru rune for maker, um, is one of the great examples of, of, of the last few months, right? We're talking about SVM, uh, Eclipse have been one of the pioneers there. Um, even with, uh, this whole, like, uh, injective, uh, SVM initiative. So personally, I think that's only a good thing that, that, um, it's, it's like entrenching the future success of, uh, SVM, but my feelings are the same. It's not like, it's not now this sudden imperative that we have to go and deploy everywhere and be like the first to do um xyz um we've got time there but but yeah it's great but you know i think what i what i would have reservations about and you know um mario's talking about the the multi-chain um aspect is also an interesting point like the, over the last year i mentioned before we did a lot of soul searching of where are we building is it the right place how's solana measure up to other ecosystems, other technologies. And um, we went to different, all kinds of different events. Uh, one of them was ETHCC in, in Paris, which is really interesting uh, experience. But one of my main takeaways from there was actually like seeing this big, like such a big overriding theme from the teams there and, and speaking to others was like, not just what are you building, but where are you building it and where are you deploying? And it was very much um, driven by incentives, driven by, and, and I think detracting from innovation. And I wouldn't like, you know, for, for me, I wouldn't like to see 
SVM evolve into something like that, right? Because then the ecosystem teams get like distracted by by this topic. You know, the, the ETC takeaway, like I said, was what chain are you deploying to, and 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 what's in it for me? Uh, and these are all like EVM chains. And is it optimistic? Or is it is it ZK? Um, and you're losing that aspect of innovation. So that's that's kind of how, how I'm thinking about it. I'm really happy that we've had this um, easy choice on where to build on SVM, and I think that's going to continue to be to be the case for a while. Yeah, I think a lot of people they just it's just so easy to to think, oh, there's this new chain. I'm going to go deploy in that new chain to try to land, land grab uh, the same app, you know, and there is, and it's just so easy, but it's not easy in like a, it's, it's an, a very seductive decision to make, to have to focus on building infra, like a, a, a new L2, than to actually focus on product market fit uh, for actual users. I think it's, it's just so much harder um, to do that than to just go and, and say, oh, well, we're going to do that when it scales, but until then we will focus on scaling. It's, uh, it's just dangerous. And that's why you see like, uh, you, do, you don't see much iteration in terms of apps. You just, they're all trying to, to scale. And mm -hmm. I think the devs, you can't really blame them because if VCs are willing to fund them, they can have like a guaranteed salary and, you know, like a funding and I'm just going to spend the, new, the next few years building that and. Um, I'll talk to the users later and uh, maybe when Vitalik writes another blog post and we grow and maybe that's when we think about the next milestone. Whereas on Solana, you don't have the excuse. It just works. You can get people. Like I was buying cappuccinos at, uh, at Breakpoint and I was, I, was, I was bringing people in that I was meeting that were like non-Solana people. And I, was, I was like, can I buy a cappuccino? I was buying them. It was instant. So I was like, that's it. You don't have an excuse. You you can scale. Just build stuff. Let's just see what people want, and just let's let's grow from here. And that's why I think the next breakout apps definitely are going to be out of Solana. Yeah, I mean we do need we do need people pushing the pushing the envelope and, and pushing the boundaries with with infrastructure. But especially as you know, we we're, we're DeFi users. My main passion is is like using DeFi and building cool things in DeFi, not necessarily building a new chain, but um, yeah, we do, it's gone so far the other way that it's it's all more like, okay, who can be the first to fork Compound on the new uh, EVM chain, right? Or shall I choose Compound or Aave or where does the next Uniswap deployment uh, get made, right? And maybe, I don't know, in 10 years or a few years time, it might be where does the uh, Camino fork get deployed, right? Which new SVM? But uh, I hope there's a bit more uh, innovation than that going on. Um, but yeah, maybe. I mean, the industry's been. It's there's been a lot of incentives rolled into that, right? Like VCs. If it's you know, we talk about the TAM, right? Like, is the TAM bigger for an app or a chain? Like, cl clearly a chain. So that's where the big valuations have been. That's where some of the big returns have been. That's where a lot of the cash has gone. Um, yeah, and are we seeing the first signs of things changing a bit? Like, like possibly. Like, there's there's definitely more interest in investing in in interesting things on on Solana now. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully that continues. Those are great answers. Well, Mark, Marius, this was a lot of fun. I think the conversation just kept getting better. I really, really, really love that in that we just had there. So, uh, guys, thanks for coming on. Excited for Camino Two. Also, the points program. So, everybody, go play with Camino. Like try it out, get some points and have some fun. So guys, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks guys. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Yep. We'll see you next time.